Hi everyone, how are you doing today? Good, glad, glad to have you in the house. It's good to have everyone who's joined us online. We're glad that you're with us as well. You know, we're in a current sermon series that uh, Pastor Mark kicked off last week, which dr- addresses the importance of developing a personal financial plan with forward-looking faith. And so last week, Pastor Mark talked about the importance of a good foundation when building for the future. If you recall, he had the building blocks out here, and there was four different ones that he specifically mentioned. Well, this week, we're going to kind of take a different angle at it, and we want to talk today about, uh, we want to share about barriers to avoid. So if you have your planner, there's an insert in there, and feel free to grab that out. Um, But we want to talk about barriers to avoid. I remember when I moved from San Diego to Bend, Oregon, one of the first things that we did was we built ourselves a home. And um, there were many barriers along the way. Many barriers, such as finding property in Central Oregon that we could afford on a smaller church's youth pastor's salary. And that wasn't easy. And then excavating the pile of rocks, the lava rocks that we could afford that we purchased to build our home on. And lava rocks are hard. They don't move easily. And so we had to bring in excavation tools. And I remember that they broke multiple chipping bits as they were trying to break the ground down and level it out enough where they could build a foundation. And there was times where weather became a barrier in moving forward and building our home. And then even building delays at times, building material delays, like waiting on things. I remember we had ordered a a, a specific bathtub. It was kind of an extra large soaker tub, I guess you could say. Um, And when it arrived, they they actually delivered a jetted tub. That sounds good. Ooh, that sounds really good, but we couldn't afford it. And so our contractor, you know, called up and said, hey, you sent the wrong tub. You need to deliver the right tub. Well, three weeks later, and we still didn't have the tub. That became a barrier to moving forward on other projects in the home to get permits and different things. And I remember finally our contractor called up the the supplier and he said, if you don't have our tub out here in three days, we're going to install this one. Guess what? It was there. Unfortunately, we didn't get the good one. But they did deliver it in two days, I think it was. And we were able to continue to move forward. See, when it comes to construction, if you're in the business, you know there's always delays. There's always things that stop you from moving forward. And the same is true in our faith, in our personal finance. There's things that want to be barriers for us to move forward. And, you know, uh, we want to talk about some, some of those barriers today. And they're, they're obvious barriers, and, and, and when I say barriers, they might, this might, that could mean um, philosophies or attitudes that we have regarding our faith and our finances. And so I want to share four of them with you today. They're consumerism, um, competition, comparison, and convenience. So if you have your notes, you can follow along. But the first one we want to talk about is consumerism. See, the lie of consumerism says having more is the key to happiness, Having more is the key to happiness. Consumerism shouts, bigger is always better. A bigger house, bigger car, bigger bank account. But Paul actually warned against the dangers of consumerism. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, this is what he wrote. He said, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money, but the love of it. <clears throat> Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. See, the Bible teaches that there's dangers in wealth. And I'm going to give you four of them today. One is wealth is often associated with overindulgence, gluttony, and greed. Two, wealth can foster a false sense of security and it can generate pride within us. Three, it can give us a sense that that we don't need God, that I got everything that I need. Why do I need God? And then number four, wealth can conflict with the demands of God's mission. Um, I've seen how consumer debt 
has done the same today. Now, I don't know if you realize this. I looked this up the other day because I wanted to kind of see where it was at today, but did you know that the average American holds a debt balance, a consumer debt balance of $96,000? Actually, over that. And it's actually growing. In the last three years, it's gone up 3.9%. Joseph Ralt said that what we swim in a sea of consumerism 365 days a year, those choppy waters can drown consumers in debt and regret. And I've known people who've actually said no or wait to Jesus' mission because of debt. And now they live with regret feeling like they missed out or they didn't really obey God. See, the wisdom of Proverbs 22.7 warns against debt. It says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is the slave to the lender. It's true that money is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. And when you're mastered by your debt, controlled by that, it's not a, it's not a fun place to be. We don't have to be rich, though, to be consumed with wealth. You need to hear that. We don't have to be rich to be consumed with wealth. The writer of Proverbs uh, wrote this in Proverbs 30, verses eight and nine. He said, and it was actually a prayer. He said, first, help me to never tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. See, discontentment is the root of consumerism. It's right at the root, that discontented heart. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, he said, yet true godliness with contentment, there's that word, is itself great wealth. Freedom from the love of money and contentment are marks of a mature believer, a mature Christian. And we, don't, we need to understand that contentment is not found in more stuff. When we have that attitude, I need more stuff to be content, we really discontent. The writer of Hebrews said, keep your life free from the love of money and be content, there it is again, with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Contentment is found in Jesus and is found in trusting in him and seeing that he's faithful. Here's the second barrier. The second barrier is competition. See, in the lie of competition says, life is an individual sport, not a team sport. Life is an individual sport and not a team sport. All competition now is not sinful, so don't hear me say that. I am not saying that, but what I am saying is when being first is most important, we've crossed that line. Why? Because that type of content competition leads to a concentration on self. If we're always concerned first and foremost with myself, I'm bound to be in conflict with those around me. And if life is a competition that I gotta win, then I'm gonna see everyone else as my opposition that has to be pushed out of the way. See, the story of Cain and Abel's toad in Genesis chapter four, and Pastor Mark Robinson last week alluded to the story, but Cain saw his offering that he brought to God as a competition rather than a sacrificial gift. Now, I've heard parents say, and my mom may have even said it, my kids fight so much, I hope they don't end up killing each other. Well, in Cain's story and in his family, unfortunately, that became a reality. And while we don't understand all the details of this first child, it does teach us some important lessons. His life does. See, Cain got angry. So you say, why did he get, get angry? Because, his, because he and his brother Abel bro- both brought offerings to God, sacrifices, gifts. Abel's was accepted, his was rejected. Cain's reaction gives us a clue that his attitude was wrong from the start. And I want you to see what God said to Cain. He said, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. See, Cain had a choice to make. He could correct his attitude. He could remove any barriers of competition 
and he could do what God required. Or he could get angry and take it out on his brother. Cain made the wrong decision. And he went down in history as the first man in history to murder someone else. He was the first murderer. Whereas Cain went down in history as the first man of faith. You see Cain listed in the book of heroes, in, in, the chapter of Hebrew, in Hebrews chapter 11, we see the heroes of the faith, and the very first man listed there is Abel. Look what it says in verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through, his, th- through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. That's right, amen. Cain's life and his faith still speaks to us today. See, Cain had had forward-looking faith that speaks to us and can be a lesson to us. And here's the thing I want you to hear. Capture this, write it down. There's no competition in God's service. There is no competition in God's service. A better foundation is collaboration. We can always accomplish more for the mission of God if we'll work together. Rather than competing, we need to collaborate by discovering the gifts that God's put in each one of us and then using them to work together to forward the mission of God in the world. See, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I put the text in your, in your handouts, and I think it's on the screen here. I would encourage you to read that on your own uh, later today or this week. But it, it teaches us that each member in the body of Christ is equally important. Each one of us is needed to accomplish the mission of God. So that's why when we make announcements like the Future Hope Initiative announcements that we make monthly, and, and we don't just celebrate the total amount given but we always celebrate the 186 individuals and family units that collaborated to allow us to give $270,000 this last year because we couldn't do it without everyone working together to make it possible. Here's the third barrier we need to avoid. It's comparison. Comparison. See, the lie of comparison says to measure up, you must level up or just give up. You must level up or just give up. See, when we compare ourselves to someone else, we will either fear, feel inferior or we'll feel superior. See, in, in, in comparison, there's no winners. Proverbs 14.30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Envy rots the bones. Theodore Roosevelt, I think he's the one who first said that comparison is the thief of joy. And I really like what Rick Warren said, Pastor Rick Warren, he said this, I think it's going to be up here. He said, your net worth has no connection to your self-worth. Your value is never based on your valuables. That's important to remember. See, Joseph's brothers fell into the trap of comparison when they compared their father's love to Joseph and they felt like they didn't measure up. So they tried to level up by removing their brother. And Acts 7 verse 9 tells us that Joseph's brothers became jealous of him. And they sold Joseph as a slave to Egypt. Now I've discovered that people make comparisons for a few reasons. Some point out the flaws in others so they can feel better about themselves. And others may be seeking reassurance that they are measuring up, that they're doing well. But you know what? We shouldn't be worried about other other people's accomplishments or lack of them. That's not our job. Instead, we need to ask ourselves, how does my life measure up to what God wants for it? How does my life measure up to God? You know, we like to to compare ourselves horizontally this way to each other because it's easy, or at least we think it's easy to find someone who's less mature than we are, who's, who's more sinful than we are, and it's, it, so we like to go this way. Much like the, the Pharisee that showed up in Luke chapter 18, and it says that he went to the temple to pray, and he began to compare himself to the sinful tax collector that was there also. 
And by comparing himself to him, he felt good about himself. Yet Jesus said it was the sinful tax collectors whose prayer was answered that day. See, we don't need to be comparing ourselves this way. Rather, we need to be comparing ourselves vertically. We need to compare ourselves to, uh, to, to vertically against God's standard. And when we do this, it keeps us humble. Paul taught in Galatians chapter 6, verse 4, he said, Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. There's freedom in that. I don't need to compare myself with anyone else if I'll just be busy doing what the Lord wants me to do. See, a better foundation is gratitude. The comparison trap causes us to focus inward and become selfish. But, um, but gratitude compels us to focus outward on those around us. That's one reason why I love to take young people on mission trips. I love to take them outside of their comfort zone, outside of their culture, and let them see that the majority of the world does not live like we do right here in beautiful Albany, Oregon, or wherever it is you're living. Sometimes after experiencing such extreme uh, guilt, I mean such extreme poverty, excuse me, students come home and they feel guilty about all the pleasures and the, the comforts of America. And in those times, I often suggest rather than feeling guilty, start living with gratitude. Start living with gratitude and thankfulness. Gratitude enables us to fulfill Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. See, God wants us to be cheerful givers who give out of gratitude. Cheerful givers who give out of gratitude. And here's the fourth barrier. It's convenience. Convenience. See, the lie of convenience says the Christian life is comfortable and convenient or it's always easy. Mark chapter 10, Jesus addressed the barrier of convenience when he encountered a rich young man. This rich man had claimed that he had obeyed all of the the law of Moses, that he had um, fulfilled all the Ten Commandments. And in a legal sense, he may have done that. But in a spiritual sense, it wasn't true. Because his attitude towards wealth was wrong. He had been coveting his comfortable and convenient life to the point it had become an idol that he had created and was separating him from God. And this is what Jesus said in in Mark chapter 10, verse 21. It says that Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven then come follow me. See, this man was so hindered by his wealth that, that nothing, nothing less than complete elimination would set him free. Now, this wasn't a command for all of us to do, but for this man, this is what he needed to do. See, when people look at their wealth as something that's to provide them with comfort and convenience only, it becomes a barrier which must be eliminated. Is your faith in Jesus based on convenience and comfort? Is that what it's based on? John Blanchard said this. He said, obedience to God should never be conditioned by our convenience or our comfort. You know, the story of Mary Mary and Joseph, the Christmas story, reminds us of this truth. Um, It teaches that when we face inconvenience and discomfort, it doesn't mean that we miss God. Or somehow God, you know, made a mistake. God didn't soften the bumpy road to Jerusalem or or to, to Bethlehem, excuse me, for Mary and Joseph. But he gave them the endurance and the strength to get through that road. He didn't provide them with a comfortable end for them to, to stay in, but he brought his child safely into the world. See, when we do God's will, we're not guaranteed comfort or convenience. We're not guaranteed an easy road, but we are promised that everything has a purpose and where he guides, he provides. Like Mary and Joseph, we need to learn to live by faith, trusting God 
even when things are uncomfortable or when things are inconvenient. So a better foundation is sacrificial generosity. Sacrificial generosity. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible on giving is 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. In this story here, King David needed to give an offering on behalf of God's people. So he showed up where he was going to give the offering, and there was someone there already saying, hey, here's everything that you need to, 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 to give your sacrifice and give this offering on behalf of the people. But King David answered this, and it's interesting how he replied. He said, no, I will pay you for it. I will not offer to the Lord my God sacrifices that cost me nothing. I've discovered an important lesson about giving, and this is what it is. Our gifts to God should require faith, they should cost us something, and they should make us uncomfortable. This is why Jesus commended the widow that put the couple pennies in the offering. It cost her something. See, it's not about how much we give, really. It's about how much we keep. How much does it really cost me? This is where my faith and my generosity attach to each other. You know, I remember a time when I was a youth pastor and I bought a brand new pair of high-tech hiking boots. I was really excited about these boots. And I'd only wore them a couple times, probably less than a, a half a dozen times when I decided I'd wear them to the youth group that night. And following the gathering, we, 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 kids were just hanging out. We were all hanging out outside. It was a beautiful weather out in Southern California at the time. And, and a student brought in this person to me. And he, he looked like he might be homeless. And he said, this guy's looking for a pastor. He wants to talk to a pastor. So he brought him to me. And so I began to talk to him, and there's kids all around, and I, I asked him, well, 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 what can we do to help you? He said, well, I need a pair of shoes. Now, I wasn't real spiritual at that moment, <laughs> because I remember thinking, oh, I should have wore a different pair of shoes. <laughs> and then I remember thinking, I hope he doesn't wear a size nine. <laughs> but I asked him the question, what size do you wear? Nine. And I knew at that moment exactly what God was telling me to do. So I sat down in a chair, and he sat down across from me, and I said, here, you can have mine. And I looked down at his feet, and he didn't have any socks on. And I remember the Holy Spirit speaking to me. He said, give him your socks as well. Now, I don't say that to say I'm super spiritual because I wasn't spiritual in that moment. At least I didn't feel that way. But I want you to hear this. My gift that day required faith. It cost me something. And yes, it made me uncomfortable. But I knew it was what the Lord had me to do. You know, Brian Loretz wrote a book called Saving the Saved, and he said this. He said, money and possessions are indicator lights that alert us to the true condition of our hearts. I think there's a lot of truth in that. And he went on to, to tell a story about John Wesley, who was the great preacher and the, the founder of the, the Methodist church, he said that while John Wesley was a student at Oxford University, he became concerned about his attitude towards wealth. So one year he asked himself a really hard question. How much money do I need to live on this year? He put the numbers together and he figured out that he needed 28 pounds to live on. So he decided in his heart that he would give the rest away. Well, that year, true to his, to his calculations, he needed 28 pounds to live on. So he gave the other two away. Well, Wesley thought to himself, I've stumbled on something. I think I'll do the rest of my life. So even though his income reached up to 1,000 pounds, he still chose to live on just what he needed and gave the rest away. You know, John Wesley asked a question that I don't hear a lot of us ask very often. It's this question, how much is enough? How much house? How much cars? How many fishing rods? How many purses? How many pairs of shoes? You fill in the blank. How much is really enough? Recently, I've been reading through the book of Leviticus, and I read a verse in chapter 23, verse 22, that really stuck out to me when I was thinking about this Wesley story. And I want to read it to you today. It says, when you harvest the grain in your land, don't harvest the grain in the corners of your fields or gather what is left after you're finished. Leave it for, 
leave it for the poor people and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. See, this law was put in place to provide for the, for the poor and the foreigners in their country. Now, the reality is most of us in here are not farmers. So we need to ask ourselves a question. We need to say, how does this apply to me? And I believe that God is telling us to look at our budget much like a harvest field and don't max it out. Don't max it out. Instead, leave some margins. Leave the corners to give spontaneously, sacrificially, generously to the mission of God, which includes the poor, the lost, and the hurting. So let me finish with this illustration. On the screen, you'll see there's a, there's a, there's a harvest field. And I want you to imagine that this harvest field represents your budget, what you make. Now, we learned last week that we're, we're to give a tithe off of our, of our total harvest. That's 10%. Pastor Mark talked about that's the first fruits offering, Proverbs 3, nine. But next, we have to determine how big of corners we're going to leave. These corners could represent the different opportunities that Pastor Mark mentioned last week, things like missions or Future Hope Initiative, alms for the poor, or even or even a local charities. But here's the good news. We get to determine how big of the corners we leave. It's up to us. Paul said that as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, he said, each one of you must give as he's decided in his heart or she's decided in her heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, God loves a cheerful giver. See, this is where our wealth attaches to our generosity. This is where our faith, let me say it that way, is a better way to say it. Our faith attaches to our generosity. See, because you might have a bigger heart for the nations. If that's the case, you get to decide how much faith and generosity of a corner you're gonna leave. I could leave a smaller corner. I might be generous and have faith and leave a bigger corner. It's up to me, I determine how much I want to give. Maybe I have a bigger heart for the next generations. As pastor's been talking about with the Future Hope Initiative, same thing applies. I get to decide with my faith and generosity how big of a corner I'm going to leave. It's between me and the Lord. And and it goes on for each and every corner in our life. We determine how generous we want to be, and that's where our faith and generosity attaches And it's also where we get to do what Proverbs talks about, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Each year, Barbara and I try to enlarge our corners a little bit more. And I can tell you this, I've discovered a long time ago that I can never outgive God. I can never be more generous than God's been generous to me. This command was given to the people of Israel while they were still in the desert. They weren't even in the promised land yet. They didn't have any corners to give But this was a command knowing that they needed to move forward in faith and go where God had called them to go. See, how we view and manage our wealth is an indicator of our faith in Jesus. What I do with my money doesn't make me a Christian. Let me say that again. What I do with my money doesn't make me a Christian, but it does show how mature of a Christian I am. 